Hello. Hello. So my name is Ann Merchant, and I want to welcome you to You Are Not Who You Were. If you've been watching the slideshow, you will know that that's the name of our event. And this is a conversation with Nadine Burke Harris and Wendy Calhoun. And we're very glad that you are here. And of course, I am joined by... I'm Rick Lovard. I'm the program director of the Science and Entertainment Exchange, which is a program of the National Academy of Sciences. So we're today going to be talking about the long-term impacts of childhood trauma and how this plays out in a clinical setting um, and also in storytelling, hence why we have our two featured guests today. And the Academies, of course, has produced a number of reports on this topic, um, including Vibrant and Healthy Kids, a report on which Nadine actually worked. Um, she was on the committee that produced that report. We also have another report called Fostering Healthy Mental um, emotional and behavioral development in children and youth, and another one called Parenting Matters. I think that Sachi, I'm looking in the chat, and she's putting a link in there for you so that you can take a look at those reports if you want to take a, a deeper dive. And of course, I think that we also have seen that in the work that we do at the exchange, that um, childhood trauma is um, part of the, the work that we're doing as part of the consults. Yeah, you know, a lot of the work we do here in Hollywood is, uh, you know, a lot of the characters who we encounter, fictional and otherwise, are working through some deep-seated uh, childhood trauma, I'd argue. Um, and uh, so if you are interested in what we do, uh, if you're a writer, producer, director, studio executive, you have a question about science as you're making a feature film, TV show, or video, you can give us a call or email us and uh, we will connect you with a field expert. And if you are a STEM professional who's just hearing about this program and has an interest in the work we're doing, please reach out. We're always looking for people to connect to storytellers. Um, I wanna thank today's sponsors, Howard Hughes Medical Institute for sponsoring this event. Also, we get major funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. And I also wanna thank all the individual donors, especially the ones who gave today, we will be sending you one of these challenge coin, and this will also get you some unique access to some uh, VIP uh, Q&A sessions that we do for some of these events. Really quickly, uh, today is just going to be a really open conversation between Wendy and Nadine. These are two incredible communicators, so we're just going to let them talk, and then at some point, they're going to turn it over to the audience. And so at any point during this event, you can ask a question in the Q&A, uh, either at the top or bottom of your screen. And I am gonna be the one who's gonna be feeding those questions to Wendy. So if she does not get to your question, it is absolutely not uh, my fault and not Wendy's fault. Um, and so please ask a question at any point. Um, and that gets us to our rabbit hole, I believe, which for me this week, my rabbit hole is, uh, <laughs> this is, as, as we were researching this event, I uh, discovered a documentary on HBO called Showbiz Kids. And uh, this is uh, all about the traumas of being a child star in Hollywood, which I felt like, anyway, that, that well went very deep. So uh, anyway, back to you, Anne. Yes, and my rabbit hole. So um, I was thinking about, I don't know that I would call it a childhood trauma, although it was hard for me. I lost my father when I was very young, and, and I don't have a lot of things that remind me of him, but I do have this. So this is a, is a gavel that belonged to him. He was um, chairman of the board of selectmen, and Rick is from New England, so he knows what that means. It's basically sort of head of the town council, and this was the gavel that belonged to him, and you can't see it, but it has his name on it and it's all scarred up because he used to bang it as part of the meetings and and I still have this and I treasure it and, and I really like it so it's something that I have of his that I really like having so that's that's my remembrance of him so um, but we are eager to get to today's program and we're looking forward to it um, as you know we have Nadine Burke Harris and Wendy Calhoun and these are two old friends of the Science and Entertainment Exchange so it's really great when we can put two old friends together Wendy has done a lot of moderating for us has been to our retreats she's somebody that when we can get on her busy schedule we always count ourselves lucky and Nadine is somebody whom I talent scouted from the TED Med stage a long time ago, and I found out that we had a mutual friend 
um, Chandler Crawford, who was her foreign rights agent for her book and a longtime friend of mine. And I secured her personal email address because I wasn't going to go through a phalanx of people that might keep me from her and sent her an email and got her to agree to appear on the exchange stage. And the rest is history. So we have put these two marvelous women together for you today to have, as Rick said, just a great conversation. And we invite you to ask them lots of good questions. And we invite them to turn on their cameras and their microphones and join us. Fantastic. So we're going to leave Anne. you to it. <laughs> Hi, Nadine. It's so wonderful to see you again. I had the pleasure of, of meeting you and hearing you speak in Malibu a few years ago, and it really had an impact on me. So I'm so delighted we have a chance to have this open conversation today. Oh, I am excited as well. This is um, this is a lot of fun, and it's also a very um, welcome uh, break from my usual day to day. Uh, so, I as, as California Surgeon General, I think uh, uh, most of our audience members know that. So, um, very excited to be here. Excellent. Well, um, I read a staggering fact that two thirds of us, two thirds of the population, have at least one adverse childhood experience, or as you call ACEs. Tell us about ACEs. What exactly is the science behind ACEs for those who don't know what that means? Sure, well, the, the term ACEs comes from a landmark study that was done now over 20 years ago, and it was conducted by the CDC and Kaiser Permanente and what they did was they asked about 17 and a half thousand adults about their histories of 10 categories of adverse childhood experiences. And those include physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent was mentally ill, substance dependent, incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce, or domestic violence. So those were the 10 criteria. And the reason that the study was so groundbreaking was because it, um, first of all, showed how common ACEs are. As you uh, mentioned, two thirds of folks experience at least one. In the original study, one in eight folks had experienced four or more of these 10 ACEs. And um, the other piece, was that there was this really strong and what we call dose response relationship between exposure to these ACEs and not just the stuff that we kind of intuitively know, right? So things like, you know, mental health and behavioral health conditions like depression or anxiety or uh, substance dependence, right? And, and there definitely was this very strong association, dose response association but also things that a lot of people hadn't thought of, like heart disease, stroke, cancer, Alzheimer's, right? And in fact, when we look at nine out of 10 of the leading causes of death in the US, pre-COVID, <laughs> nine out of 10, the, the higher the A score, the greater the risk for you know, nine out of 10 of these, of these leading causes of death. And so we now understand, and here's the, the piece, when the A study originally came out, they saw this really strong association. They say, okay, you know, rough things happen to you when you're a child, you're at greater risk for different health conditions in adulthood. But there was like a, a little bit of a black box, a mystery in between, like how does that happen? And that is the piece that I've spent the better part of my professional career doing researching and understanding. And what we now know is that there's a, a biological process called the toxic stress response. That when we're exposed to trauma or adversity, and especially during childhood, because during childhood is when our brains and bodies are just developing, it activates our stress response, right? And that's normal, that's what's supposed to happen. But if that stress response, which includes you know, the release of all these stress hormones like adrenaline and cortisol, right? Um, that activates our brains, activates our immune systems, activate our hormonal systems. If that happens too often, it can actually lead to long-term changes in our brains, our hormonal system, 
our immune system, and even the way our DNA is read and transcribed. And so that is what scientists and doctors now call the toxic stress response. We now understand that that prolonged activation of the stress response is what leads to all these things. And now that we understand that, we can actually start doing interventions that are targeted at regulating the stress response. Okay, did you, did you really just say that this stress, this toxic stress could actually get coded in our DNA? For sure, that is fascinating. And this is research that has happened in um, lots and lots of different places, but he, this, is, um, this is what's so fascinating about it is that that activation of the stress response that leads to all of these stress hormones, these stress hormones, um, they change not our genetic code, right? But uh, the way that our genetic code is determined by what we call epigenetic regulation. These are markers that sit on top of your DNA. So if you think of your genetic code almost like musical notes on a page, you think of epigenetic regulation as the musical notations, right? Let's say like, oh, play this part really loud and strong, you know, forte, or play this part really soft, or play this again, or skip that part. Like for anyone, I, I'm not a musical person, but for anyone who's ever studied music, that is our epigenetic markers tell our cells how much of a certain protein to produce, how, how many times it should replicate, you know, itself, uh, et cetera. And that epigenetic, those, those markers are, can be profoundly changed by stress hormones. So they actually change the way our DNA is read and transcribed. Wow. I know. Wow. You know, something that's been top of mind lately for me, my rabbit hole has been this, all the talk that's going on around, you know, um, generational trauma. Um, and, and, and this, kind of talks to what you're saying right now. Um, do you, have you done research or looked into that as well? So people talk about generational trauma and this is, the science behind it is profound. We've, um, so researchers have looked at it uh, among children and grandchildren of individuals who survived the Holocaust. Um, they've looked at it in, in, in multiple different populations and seen that these changes to the epigenetic markers can be handed down from generation to generation to generation, which really explains why grandchildren of individuals who, who experience the Holocaust actually are at greater risk for a certain uh, health conditions and behavioral health conditions. And you can actually see it through the epigenetic markers. But here's what's dope. And I will just say this is because they've done this, these studies in animals, right? So I don't, I don't know if you've ever heard of this lick your pup study, but there was a researcher in at McGill University and he had these two sets of rats and they had their babies. And some of the rats, oh, they stressed them out. They, 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 they uh, you know, they stressed out these rat babies. And some of the moms did lots of like snugging, snuggling and hugging and lots of what they call licking and grooming, soothing their babies. And some of the moms really didn't, right? And those babies then when they grew up, the ones who got lots of nurturing care, they were, they had better stress tolerance. They actually measured the functioning of their biological stress response. And it not only, it, it turned itself off more normally after a stressor. And so these, and th so they, their stress response was more normally functioning. So they could navigate a maze more easily. They could, you know, all of these things. Whereas the ones whose moms didn't do a lot of nurturing care, they, you know, they performed worse on these cognitive tests. They had a harder time regulating their stress response when it was activated and shutting it back off, all of these things. And then when they looked at these rats, their, the difference was in their epigenetic markers. Mm. But here's the cool thing. I'll try to say this really fast. Here's the super cool thing. Was that the next generation of rats, they had the mom, the, the babies who were from a, a low nurturing mom and the babies from a high nurturing mom, and they switched them at birth. 
And then they did the same thing. They stressed him out. And the high nurturing mom nurtured her foster child, right? The low nurturing mom did low nurturing of her foster child. And then when they grew up, the behavior of the rats tracked with their rearing mother, not their biological mother. But then when they looked at their epigenetic regulation, right, their DNA markers, they had the DNA markers of their rearing mother, not of their biological mother. What? Can okay. we talk about that? <laughs> this is where, didn't, so didn't when, that coming. We, when we talk about how our environment shapes our biology, like we can experience stress and that stress can change our biology, but just as stress can be handed down from one generation to the next on our epigenetic, through our epigenetic markers, nurturing care can also, the effect of nurturing care can also be handed down from one generation to the next. That's wild. That's wild. You know, um, we have a lot of people who are, are with us today who are from my world, you know, Hollywood. And I, I just got off of a show um, that w ran for two seasons on Fox called Prodigal Son. And Ace is, really was at the center of this show in so many ways. Um, our lead characters, and it's extreme, right? It's broadcast television, but our lead character, his father was a serial killer who was arrested and he actually called the cops on him when he was 10 years old. And so a lot of our story, especially in the first season, went back to that moment of trauma. And we, we kept mining for ways to play it out in series, what the effects of, was, of that toxic stress. And so some of the things that Malcolm Bright had, who was the lead was, you know, he had insomnia, he had um, a hand tremor, he had low appetite, he um, had nightmares. Um, I'm just so curious, um, in people or who are, who are suffering from toxic stress, how does that sort of manifest itself in life? What are sort of the things we should be kind of looking for when we're looking at someone who might be dealing with ACEs? So um, the, the, um, it, it's really interesting because I think that um, the, the things that we see most commonly and the things we see most commonly in the media are, are things like, well, the things that we see most commonly are what I call neuropsychiatric impacts, right? So folks who uh, either have some version of PTSD or uh, depression or anxiety or some, um, or, or anger, right? And that's, I think, reflective of the world and what we see. And, and I think those are very common outcomes of someone having a history of ACEs. I think that what's less commonly seen, so sleep is oh, very, very common. That's a, like, that's a big one. It's almost, yeah, it's very, very closely correlated. And a lot of the things that you talked about are, are right on target. Some of the things that are less known or less often associated with the history of adversity are things like frequent infections, right? Autoimmune disease. So Dax Shepard, um, the actor, has a show called, has a podcast called Armchair Expert. And I was talking with him on the show. And when we were talking and I was saying, talking about autoimmune disease, he said, oh my goodness, he uh, has autoimmune disease. And he says, when he is stressed or when his, you know, when his head isn't right, he uses many more expletives than I do. His, um, his, he has a flare up of his autoimmune disease, right? And that's something that I think a lot of people don't really associate the impact on our immune system, right? And so with, your, with the immune system, you can see inflammation, so inflammatory disease. So we even see stuff like arthritis, right? Like folks who have high ACEs have a higher prevalence of arthritis. And then we also see, um, um, but you also see the effects of an immune system that's not regulated well. And so you see more vulnerability to infection. And then there's also, for example, um, 
you know, so in the, in the long term, we see greater risk of things like, you know, um, cancer or, oh, here's another one, uh, dental disease. Nobody ever thinks about uh, uh, cavities, dental caries. That, that's another one. But I mean, the common things, headaches, asthma. I don't know if people recognize asthma, like someone with four more ACEs, a child with four more ACEs, twice as likely to have asthma as a child with zero ACEs, right? Mm -hmm. So I will say just as a reference, anyone who wants to like, I know you guys aren't gonna like dig deep into uh, necessarily all like the super scientific work, but the, we, I, my office just put out the Surgeon General's report on adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And that we have a lot of information about all these different outcomes. So if anybody wants like reference material, you can go there. Um, but, um, but, but those are some of the things. And when you were looking to try to understand, when you were telling this story, um, how, how did you think about, or how did that work in the writer's room as you were thinking about telling the story of trauma and how it was showing up for your character? So interesting, you know, as writers, we often pull from our own life experience. That's, a, that's one of the first go-tos. And so I think one of the things we would do is share stories about, you know, how we would deal with, um, if, if, we, if we could walk in Malcolm's shoes, you know, how we would deal with some of the things he's going through. Um, and, and then stories just start coming out from our personal lives. Um, I think you may even have a personal story that you could share. I'm curious, you know, did you experience ACEs in your own life? And once you got to the science of recognizing it, you know, what were you able to do with, with that awareness? I will tell you my own experience is that I did not learn about ACEs in medical school or in residency. So I was, and I, you know, I did my residency training at Stanford. I did a master's in public health at Harvard. Didn't learn about any of this, right? And then I, um, I was in practice. I was in clinical practice, although I had done research when I was an undergrad at Berkeley on stress hormones. So I already kind of was trained to think in the language of stress hormones. And then, um, uh, the thing that got me um, was that I was caring for um, uh, patients. Like I was working in a very low income, high, you know, underserved neighborhood. And a lot of the kids that I was seeing had experienced a lot of trauma. But um, there was one case in particular where I was caring for two siblings. Um, uh, who were three and four years old. And their mom had driven with them in the backseat of the car without seatbelts through a building. And I was doing their foster care physical as they were going into foster care. And I remember thinking to myself, God, I wonder what that must have felt like for these kids. Like, how does the how does that feeling impact their bodies? And so, because as their doctor, right, like that's my job. Um, and uh, the piece of it, in terms of like, I didn't. The piece of it that was resonant for me was that I didn't have to wonder what that felt like um, physically because. I, my, uh, in this case, there, the mom was uh, paranoid schizophrenic and that's why she experienced uh, schizophrenia and that's why she, um, you know, drove the car through the building. And my own mom experienced uh, schizophrenia. I grew up with a parent with untreated mental illness. And I feel like now my mom is, you know, well-treated and well-managed and, um, I have a great relationship with my mom and I'm really grateful that I have a mom. But, you know, for 29 years, my mom was untreated. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me was such a powerful insight because I, the combination between my own experience of, of like 
knowing what it feels like to have that like heart pounding moment. And then also my doctor brain being like heart pounding. Well, that's got to be adrenaline. That's uh, epinephrine binding to the receptor leading to the positive inotropic effect on my heart rate, right? Like, you know, that's, that's like, so it was, uh, so then Harvard, Stanford, please. (laughs) That was the, uh, that was what was fascinating about it for me was really being able to take my own experience to generate the insights, to ask the questions, right? Of how is this affecting my patients? And then if this is affecting my patients, then what do I, what can I do about it, right? Because having been a kid who no one intervenes ever, right? I didn't even know. I didn't even know it was not normal, right? Right. 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 And at least to say, how do we do things differently? And I think that's a big part of the power of storytelling, right? right? Because what you have the opportunity to do is tell people like, cause, cause a lot, of, I mean, a lot of kids, if they see it in the media, if they see it told in a story and they see their own story, and they recognize and they hear that like, oh, that's, there's a different way, right? There can be a different way. And that's the, that's the thing I feel like is so important. I think for you, what motivates your storytelling? Oh boy, Um, curiosity. For the most part, um, empathy, trying to find empathy for the characters that I write um, really motivates me a lot. Um, And I am really committed to this idea of raising awareness around things. I mean, I think that's one of the things that really attracted me to be a part of this today is because I, I understand that this ACEs exist. And I do think it's important that we start to recognize that. There's actually a great question that came in from Tracy. She says, is there a relationship between ADHD and ACEs? And I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Because I also, if I understand it correctly, a lot of time ACEs get misdiagnosed. And I'm so curious to hear you talk about that. So this is the piece. Yes, there is. Okay. So this is fascinating and I will try not to get geek out too sciencey, but this is the science and entertainment exchange. So I'm allowed to be geeky. Um, So (laughs) when you look at the effect of stress hormones on the brain, right? um, The way that it, the effect of stress hormones on cognitive function is that if you don't have enough stress hormones, you can't pay attention. You can't focus. Right. And it's, um, it's, it's like a U-shaped curve. It goes like this. So you, if you don't have enough stress hormones, you can't pay attention, you can't focus, you add more and you are more focused, more attentive, right? And then you get too much. So imagine you have uh, one cup of coffee and you're like, I'm in the zone, right? For some people it's two for whatever, but you know, you, you, it increases your uh, co- performance on your cognitive function. But then if you have 10 cups of coffee, you can't focus to save your life, right? You're all over the place. And that's actually what happens is your your cognitive function declines as you have an overload of stress hormones. Now, you remember I just said that the toxic stress response is this biological response in which you have prolonged activation of the biological stress response. So you have, generally speaking, too much stress hormones and it's overloading. And so this is what I was seeing all the time in my, um, in my clinic, all these kids who were sent to me for ADHD. And then we would screen them for ACEs. We screen all of our kids for ACEs and we're training all the doctors in California to screen kids and adults for ACEs. And for my kid who has an ACE score of zero, nothing else going on, probably their brain is making too few, you know, uh, hormones to help them be attentive. So you, what do you, what's the treatment? Number one treatment for ADHD, it's Ritalin. It's a stimulant. You give a stimulant, that's the treatment. Because if they don't have enough uh, for, to support their attentive function, right? Then they're gonna be down here. 
So you give a stimulant and it improves. Fantastic. But if the kid is distracted, disorganized, forgetful, impulsive, but it's because their brain is overloaded with stress hormones, adding a stimulant doesn't help. And that's what I saw over and over again. I saw these kids who had these behavioral problems or ADHD symptoms, and then you know someone would put them on a stimulant, didn't help, and in fact, sometimes their behavior got worse. And then some of these kids would come in on antipsychotics, on Seroquel, on Risperdal, on all kinds of like really powerful medications. I had one patient came in, he was on five different psychotropic medications. Wow. And we put them on, we, we gradually, you know, switched them over and we actually, and this is the thing, people are like, oh, don't medicate those kids. It's not don't medicate them, use the right medicine. So there's a medicine called guanfacine that is actually a blood pressure lowering medication. And this is why doctors, we need to know what we're treating. It's a blood pressure lowering medication and it actually turns down the stress response, right? So for many of my kids with high ACEs, instead of starting them on Ritalin, we start them on guanfacine. And for some of our kids, they go from three, four, five medications down to one medication and BT dubs, their behavior is way better, <laughs> right? So they're able to self-regulate, they're less impulsive. So there's a huge connection. Wow. Wow. You know, we have so many great questions coming in, but I, I want to get to this topic before we move on. Um, I think all of our scores went up in 2020. We just are. Mm. On the, and, you know, and we, we're, we're all dealing right. I have two daughters. We're, we're going through the parenting of everybody dealing with some new level of trauma after yep. this pandemic or, or we're still really in it. But as we phase out of it, it's almost like another level of trauma is coming. I feel, can you talk a little bit about how we can start to, um, uh, how we can start to help ourselves somewhat? And what are some of the ways we can alleviate some of these toxic stress situations? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, you want to talk about an activated stress response, try being the first state surgeon general in the middle of a pandemic with four kids who are homeschooling. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> So this is, this is um, but here's what's dope. Okay, so when we talk about the toxic stress response, and again, I'm gonna get a little science-y because I love this. When we talk about the to toxic stress response, we're talking about this prolonged activation of the stress response. And there's one important criteria that I didn't mention. In absence of adequate nurturing, buffering, care, and other interventions. Now, there's two pieces of that that's really important, and that's what leads. So. Our stress response is activated. It's supposed to be activated. And then you remember those rats and the pups and the licking and the nurturing care? When we do nurturing care, it actually releases um, hormones in our body like oxytocin, right? And other hormones that directly com combat and turn off the stress response, right? So as a mom, I got four kids. When something scary happens to my kids, when they fall down, they hurt themselves, they do something, whatever. What do I do? Instinctively scoop them up, hug them, you know, give them some kisses, whisper to them and find out what they're scared about and make sure that they know that they're safe, right? Mm -hmm. And every time I do that, that releases healthy hormones in their brain that turns off the stress response, right? So now we understand that that nurturing care does that. What else turns off the stress response? Exercise. I don't know if you all experience this, but you go, you do that yoga class, you go for the run, you do whatever. That helps shut off the stress response. Meditation. That helps to not just regulate the stress response, but our stress response is our fight or flight response. The, the what counteracts our, what, what actually helps to turn off the stress response is the other half of that part of our nervous system called the, the parasympathetic nervous system. It's the resting and digesting. So when we meditate, we actually strengthen the parasympathetic nervous system. All of this is in the Surgeon General's report, but we strengthen the parasympathetic nervous system, right? So that we can better be in this balance, okay? Believe it or not, going for a walk out in nature. You ever notice that like you go for a hike, you're out in this big, beautiful place, the trees and it's calm and it's still, and you're like, God, my blood pressure just went down 10 points. Being in nature, if you hook up an EEG to someone's head and you read their brain electrodes, 
their brain activation will move towards a more balanced, less stress activated um, uh, brain waves when you are in calm, peaceful nature, right? So being in nature is another one. Uh, safe, stable, and nurturing relationships, exercise. Oh, so rem keep in mind that uh, a big part of what we, a big part of what happens in um, in the toxic stress response is you have this. Um, a, it's both what happens in our brain, but also in our immune system, right, and also in our hormonal systems. So our diet is really important for regulating our immune system and our hormonal system. So an anti-inflammatory diet is a, an important component of helping to regulate the toxic stress response because that decreases the inflammation part. So this is like essentially, you know, a low refined carbohydrate diet, you know, lean protein, uh, antioxidants, that, that kind of stuff. Those are lots of nuts, lots of fish oil, that kind of stuff. Those things can also help. And so we notice things like, um, so, so nutrition is another thing. All of these, let me see, sleep, exercise. Oh, sleep. Sleep is another thing. Sleep hygiene, right? So we know that sleep is one of the things that's most sensitive when we feel stressed because both adrenaline as a stress hormone and cortisol, which is a adrenaline short-term stress hormone, cortisol long-term stress hormone, they both mess with our sleep. Right. And so having good sleep hygiene. So you're training your brain. Like if you go to bed at the same time every night, then when that time shows up, like you see this on your iPhone, it's like bedtime. You can set the bedtime app. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that, but you're, you and your brain entrains and then your brain becomes sleepy at the same time every evening. And so having good sleep hygiene in terms of going to bed in a place that is cool, calm, quiet, and uh, not having devices before bed and uh, uh, going to bed at the same time and avoiding you know, caffeine. All of those things help to improve our sleep quality and the better sleep quality. During our sleep, our brain regulates its stress hormones and so if you have disrupted sleep that actually generates more stress hormones. And so having good sleep hygiene is another thing. So sleep, exercise, nutrition, mindfulness, mental health, talking to a therapist, that's a thing that we see a lot of in, in storytelling. We see right. like someone has a history of trauma, they, have ther they get therapy. And then like, that's the thing. Where I think with the other interventions, there are fewer, um, it's, it's less obvious the connection. So people, it's, people, sometimes the connection is clear that like, oh, exercise helps to regulate my stress hormones. Um, but the other pieces, and people get like mindfulness helps, you know, me feel less stressed or whatever. Um, um, but I think that oftentimes one of the biggest misperceptions and one of the biggest things that I think is what's necessary right now is that when we talk about ACEs and when we talk about toxic stress, one of the big challenges is that people say, oh, well, what can we do about it? I can't go back and undo my ACEs, right? But we know that the way that ACEs lead to health problems is by the activation of this toxic stress response, the prolonged activation of the biological stress response. And we all actually feel greater activation of our stress response from the pandemic. And the big myth, the big lie that's out there that makes me so angry is that, that this is untreatable. Like we don't, we don't know how to solve this or there's only one solution and it's just to be doing therapy, you know, sitting on the couch uh, once a week. And if that's not the only thing you do, then, then nothing else is gonna work. And that's not true. What I would say, especially for adults and especially for all of us coming through the pandemic is that we have to overlay these things. Honestly, like for me, it's like chemo, like for someone who has administered chemotherapy for someone with, with cancer, right? Like you, you do some of this and then, you know, the regimen, you know, you have a regimen, you're like six rounds of this and then two rounds of this, and then you have to go with this rescue medicine, right? This is like, 
I'm like, okay, the daily exercise and the daily meditation, you know, connecting with the people in my life who make me feel understood and safe and, you know, whatever, like that's another dose. I'm going to do that regularly for a lot of people. The other thing that helps to regulate the stress response is being of service to others. Mm. Right. So I'm going to do, you know, sprinkle in a little bit of that. All of those pieces are demonstrated to help to regulate the stress response and lead to improve health outcomes. And that is a story I feel like is, does not get told often enough. Right. That it's a holistic kind of look at how to take care of things. Although I do feel better after hearing you speak because the first thing to go for me from 2020 was sleep. I could not get sleep. I was just really full of insomnia. But the thing that saved me in many ways was my garden. And that's, you know, that's both exercise, that's nature, that's some meditation. I also took up transcendental meditation. I started doing things that just made me feel good. And it sounds like that's right along the lines of what you're saying um, and how to deal with toxic stress. And you have this thing called numbers. What, what is numbers? Yes, number story. This is so important. So as we're, as we're talking, right, all of this, what is really powerful about this is that um, all of this understanding and knowledge exists, but there are so many people, only about 20% of Americans have ever even heard of ACEs. Mm. Only 20%. Okay. And two thirds of us have experienced at least one. And uh, so one of the things that I'm really excited by and proud of is that uh, my office worked together with the ACE Resource, Resource Network on a national public education campaign that's called numberstory.org. And that's a place where someone has questions, if they've experienced their own ACEs, if they're looking for resources, if they're trying to figure out, okay, I'm a parent, how am I, how am I not handing down my, my ACEs to my kids, right? How do I break that intergenerational cycle? All of that information, references, resources, materials is on the numberstory.org website. And it's a place where people can go to get information. And it's also raising awareness. So we're, it's something I'm in, incredibly, incredibly proud of. We've gotten some some fancy celebrities to talk about their number story. And uh, we got some young folks talking about their number story. And I think that one of the most important pieces of really transforming this public health crisis is public awareness. And so mm. that's- Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. Um, we are living in the, uh, more than just the pandemic, we had, a lot of social activity, if you would like to say. We've had, a, you know, we had what happened with George Floyd and this opening up of um, Black liberation to be top of mind. We talk about what's going on with women. We talk about Asian Americans. We talk about, you know, Jewish Americans. We're talking about a lot of different people who are, um, are different cultures and ethnicities. And how do they, how do, how do ACEs affect them? And I'm gonna give a shout out to my sister-in-law, Aisha Calhoun, who's on right now, who, who is a therapist. And um, she wants to know about racism and ACEs. Aisha, <laughs> thank you so much for the question. It is so important. So a couple of different ways. So one of the things that we see, it, the CDC just re released some data um, about two years ago that showed that uh, black and brown communities and our LGBTQ communities experience higher rates of ACEs, right? Not surprisingly, so it's, it's very interesting actually because the original ACE study was done in a population that was 70% Caucasian, 70% college educated, right? So this was Kaiser San Diego, it was a very white middle class and that's where the original thing was like, oh my God, two thirds of people, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that was really powerful. And then later data by the CDC shows that um, shows that uh, communities of color and our LGBTQ communities have uh, experienced higher, uh, higher ACEs just on average. And then there's a, there's a couple of different pieces that we can think about as well, right? So one, when we think about 
historical adversity and the effect on our epigenetic regulation, you think immediately about Native Americans, about African Americans, what has been endured and the way that some of those epigenetic markers may be handed down and impacting the health and well being of our populations today. That's number one. Number two, the effect of de facto and de jure segregation means that communities of color are more likely to be in poverty, which is also another risk factor for toxic stress, right? So we, some of those same prolonged activation of the biological stress response. Experiencing discrimination is another risk factor for toxic stress. It's not one of the traditional ACEs, right? Because those ACE criteria were the ones that they looked at in the original study, but it also has been demonstrated scientifically to activate that toxic stress response, right? To lead to the prolonged activation. And we don't, none of us needs to go further than to look at the, you know, for those who saw the George Floyd video, which I didn't for a long time, it was really hard for me. And then when I watched it, I was like, okay, so this is why, because I can feel it in my body, yeah. right? And, um, and I can feel, you know, I go, I go for my walk and my workout in the morning and I feel, you know, I was coming around a corner, coming out of some woods really quickly. And right at the exit of that corner was a police, police officer standing outside his police car. And of course, in my mind, I'm the Surgeon General of California. I'm just like, I hope I don't look like somebody, like, I hope I don't get shot coming quick around this corner, right? That's what's in my mind. And when that happens, that activates my stress response. And this is what we see in, in our communities. The, on the flip side of that, one of the things that I wanna say that's really positive, and this is why I love being a scientist and a researcher, is that the, when the former federal administration had their practice of separating children from their caregivers at the border, I um, went and testified before Congress. And I am so proud that the federal court ruling that enjoined that process and told the federal government, you're no longer allowed to separate children from their caregivers cited the research and the data on toxic stress and say, this is biologically harmful to children in a way that is damaging for future decades, right? And so federal government, you're not allowed to do it. And I was like, hooray. And they literally said in there, can, you know, this practice can lead to the toxic stress response. And so this is where the storytelling is so powerful because the more people who know this, the more we see the elimination of practices and policies that generate toxic stress. Well, you know, if two thirds of us already have it, and I'm gonna predict that it's like 99% of us now after this pandemic have at least one, you know, ACE. I mean, there's got to be, there's got to be a way there's some positivity here, right? I mean, I've often heard you say that it could also be your superpower. Could you speak yeah. to that? How is an ACE a superpower? So there's a couple of ways, and I will say probably a lot of people in this audience who've experienced ACEs um, recognize this. So one of, the, one of the ways in which it feels like that's true for me was that, you know, for me as a child, uh, it was often very unpredictable what scenario I was coming home to, whether it was happy, loving mom or whether it was scary, not doing well mom. Mm -hmm. And so being able to read very subtle cues uh, to, to say, hey, okay, what's going on here? What is the state of mind? What is the, and pick up on that very quickly was very important for me, right? Uh, it was a survival skill. And so when I became a physician and I, you know, 
being a doctor, 90% of our ability to diagnose something is based on what people, what our patients tell us, what happened, what didn't happen. And, uh, and so as a doctor, you know, oftentimes I would be able to read very subtle cues for my patients and then ask the right follow-up question. That is a gift that I was given that was born out of some of the worst and scariest moments of my life but it's now one of my superpowers that I use for good. And what's interesting about it, the thing about, part of the reason I love superhero stories <laughs> is because superheroes, like I feel like aces are just part of the origin story of just about every superhero, right? Like something bad happens. And my favorite, one of my favorites is X-Men, right? Mm -hmm. I grew up reading the X-Men comics and the X-Men, something, you know, they're mutants, they, their parents reject them, they have to go to Professor Xavier's, you know, school for gifted children. But most of them, as they start out, they're blowing shit up, right? They don't know how to use their gifts. They think their gifts are a curse and they're, they're setting stuff on fire. <laughs> And what Professor X does is that he trains them how to use their gifts and how to, and it's a lot of what they do is almost like meditative or mindfulness. He really teaches them how to channel, first of all, how to learn about their gifts, right? To say, okay, well, what's going on with me? This is who I am. Okay, I guess I got scales or I can shape shift or I can, you know, I've got superhuman strength, whatever it is. You know, I shoot photons out of my chest, right? <laughs> how, do I, how do I use that for good and not hurt the people I love? Cause that's one of the things that a lot of the kids that go to Professor X's school, they're like, oh man, I was just doing, I just was doing, I was just being me. And, you know, I killed my brother or I blew some, you know, I blew something up or I set a house on fire and I feel terrible and I'm bad, right? And that is something that I saw in my patients in, in Bayview Hunters Point. They were told that they were bad, right? Mm -hmm. And I, you know, one of the things, just as an example, I don't want to go on, but there's one example. So here's a crazy thing. If you have a overactive stress response, that means that um, your body may release more stress hormones when you're experiencing a stressor, right? Even a small stressor. So you have this huge release of stress hormones, including adrenaline and cortisol. But these things were designed to help you fight, for, you know, fight a bear, right? So... How many people on the football field, on the basketball court, have a history of ACEs? Upwards of, it's a high percentage. And How what many is boxers? That, right, boxers, exactly. And what does that do? Every time that you're going back to, you know, me and my doctor brain and what does it do to my cardiac contractility? Your heart can pump stronger and faster than the dude who's got zero aces, mm -hmm. right? It might increase your risk for cardiovascular disease, but it also, um, but it also means that you can run faster, jump higher, you, your threat detection system, you're, you're, uh, you're an offensive lineman, you're a whatever, right? Your threat detection system is higher than the dude who didn't have it. So when you're on the field, you're a boss, right? right? You're a beast. Right. Yeah, you know, it's funny. I was listening to you talk about X-Men and I don't think I'm gonna ever watch Frozen the same way again. <laughs> Elsa, <laughs> like That's a case so study you know, right I, there. I have not seen Frozen. Don't tell anybody, but I have not oh, seen it. Does, okay. Does, does Elsa have aces? Oh yeah. <laughs> you definitely got to check it out. I don't want to spoil it for you, but yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I want to ask you a few questions from the people who, who joined us yeah. today. We only have a few minutes left, but this has been so fascinating. Um, we have one, let's see. We have one from Cheryl. She says, once epigenetic changes happen, can they be reversed or is this physical change permanent? 
with ways to treat but not cure. Once that, so we're still trying to understand that. Um, so typically there's a window of time during which there is epigenetic plasticity. And so for example, with those rat pups, if that licking and grooming happened in the first 10 days of their life, you, you could see epigenetic changes and after that it wouldn't lead to a change. Um, and then when they had their own babies for the next generation, it would be the first 10 days. One of the things that doctors are looking into and research are trying to understand is if, there's, if it's possible to reopen some of those windows of plasticity for epigenetics. But at this time, it is not possible, but maybe someone will write a sci-fi story about being able to reopen epigenetic windows. <laughs> which would be very cool. Um, let's see, we've got one from Craig. Does the uh, accumulation of ACEs trigger more stress response? In other words, a child who witnesses witness one incident of abuse in the household versus a child who grew up with it every day? Yes, so cumulative ACEs uh, is the is the biggest risk predictor. And I'm so glad that you mentioned that because again, related to COVID. So the other thing that can happen is that someone can accumulate a certain amount of ACEs, right? Or, or other stressors, risk factors for toxic stress. And they don't have, um, they don't have symptoms, right? They're healthy. They don't have uh, mental health concerns or behavioral health concerns. And then a subsequent stressor in life will tip them over. It's called stress sensitization. So for example, one of the, some of the research we see from the military is that individuals, the higher the ACE score, the more likely that when you go through your military service, that you then will later develop a uh, stress-related health condition. They looked a lot at like PTSD and depression and those types of things, but there are other stress-related health conditions as well. But the higher your ACEs, it's not only the more likely you'll have a health condition, but if you don't have a health condition and then you're exposed to a subsequent stressor like a pandemic, right? right then you can tip over due to stress wow. sensitization. Yeah. So that's well, why having this awareness and putting into place these practices to help to regulate our stress response is so important because we can prevent these harms by doing regular practices to, to, to regulate our stress response. Right. Well, I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation because I feel like as a writer, we kind of know, we know how to develop characters, but we often don't know, you know, scientific research to back up our pitches. We just kind of know they exist. Kind of like you, you know, you knew that you had a very interesting response of being able to read people. We, we have it too. We just don't always know how to um, articulate it in the fashion that is so scientific as ACEs. So I really encourage everybody to, you know, jump in on this research, read about it and look at your stories you're already working on and you're probably already seeing some things and maybe finding a way to make them more cute and also finding, you know, new, new ways to express them. I think there's some go-tos we use, especially in television that are sort of repetitive, but there seems to be a vast array of ways to really bring this, these ideas to awareness out there. Well, I think that it's always hard for us when we look at the clock, because I think our audiences would agree. This could be another hour long conversation. And I think we could all stick with it because y'all are stars. And thank you so much for this. I, I We want you back again for part two, because I know there's a part two. I know there's a sequel to this. <laughs> Um, I want to I want to quickly thank Ameche and Courtney and Sachi and Jeff from our team and Nadine. Is there anyone from your team that you want to? I know your team did a lot of work on this. Is there anyone? My amazing team. I want to thank the team at the ACE Resource Network and uh, Julie on my team in the Office of the Surgeon General. Thank you. There were over 120 questions. We got to as many as we could. Uh, Wendy, you did an amazing job. Uh, sorry, we did not get to a lot of questions. 
No, it's always yeah. really hard, but you know, we have an engaged audience and we thank our audience for, for really, you know, being there for us and for asking so many questions because we know you're paying attention. It's clear that you are and that you're curious and, and that, um, and we hope you're back next week. We have Gary Hoover with us. Um, if you did tune into the Nobel prize summit, um, in April, then you will have heard Gary and he is back on our stage, which is going to be pretty awesome. He's an economist from Tulane and he studies the connection between economics and race. So that pro that should prove to be another really interesting conversation. So join us next week. Sachi will get that invitation into your inbox and we'll be back on June 9th. So thank Thanks, you very Nadine. much. Thanks, Wendy. Thanks, Nadine. Yeah.